Welcome into the Mike Herndon Show, Week 11. I am Mike Herndon. I am joined, as always, by Easton Freeze, Director of Published Content for BroadwaySportsMedia.com, the website that brings you this wonderful show, as well as many others. Uh, how are we doing this week, Easton? I'm great. I'm great. I heard things went well enough with Zach last week. Thanks to him for stepping in while I was on my honeymoon. I'm kind of surprised that like the show is still here. The FCC hasn't shut us down. Um, but I'm glad that things went well and that you guys got to go over some film from that game while I was having some fun on vacation. But I am back and we're ready to go over some uh, a, a little bit of film today and then we've got some stuff to talk about regarding the Titans. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, hanging by a thread, I think, is probably the, the right way to put it. Um, you know, with, with <laughs> the Zach status of the show as, as co host. Yeah, yeah. He, uh-huh. uh, he, he brought the bare minimum to the table, you know. So. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It sounds about right. That sounds yeah. about right. Well, we're we're bringing the bare minimum to the table today with film, um, almost by necessity, because as folks know, this is not Thursday night um, when you're seeing this pop up. It's either Wednesday night or Thursday morning. Uh, we're we're a day ahead of schedule because the Titans are on a short week. So so are we trying to get this out to you before the Titans play on Thursday night football. But that means not as much time to go, sift through the film, pull clips, all of that good stuff. So. We, we promise to make it up to you on the back end next week. We'll do a, a full-throated, um, regular, maybe even, I mean, our regular is a bonus. Let's be honest. We always go over the time that we set aside for film next week. We will be certain to do that. Today, we've got a couple of clips to look at that you pulled for your article this week at paulkarski.com. And uh, it's mostly offense, passing game stuff. So that's at least fascinating to take a look at. And then we will get in our abbreviated show to some topics to talk about that um, not film breakdown, but no less interesting. There's plenty to talk about ahead of this big game for the Titans on the road. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do think the uh, the biggest takeaway that I had coming out of this this Titans Broncos game was was the reemergence of the passing game with with Ryan Tannehill back under center. Um, Me too. You know, and look, he passed for 255 yards. Uh, you know, once you take out sack numbers and stuff like that, they they had 244 total yards passing, which doesn't sound like a ton like that. That's not a huge number, obviously, but it is the most that the Broncos have allowed all season. So that that yep. is their high water mark as far as passing yards allowed <laughs> this year. Um, they were playing without Justin Simmons, which I think is necessary to bring up in that uh, as a caveat to that. You know, no Bradley Chubb, no uh, uh, Baron Browning, obviously. So there, there were some guys out for Denver. Um, but they were, they still had Patrick Sertan. They still had K1 Williams, who is one of the best slot corners in the NFL. Uh, they still had Kareem, uh, Jackson, who's still an excellent safety, uh, as well as Draymond Jones and several other good players, players on that defense. That defense is very, very talented, very, very well schemed. Those guys uh, are all great, Mike. It's just, you, when you got an MWI, there's not a whole lot you can do sometimes. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and there's just, uh, it's really hard to stop MWI. Never mind. That. Right. You know, you just got to slow them down is all you can hope to do. He had been zeroed for three straight games, and he breaks out with a uh, 119 <laughs> yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, just uh, just as we all expected. Um, it's very it adept really timing. Of, one of the craziest results uh, of the season, just given that coming into the game, I was convinced, and I said it on the show last week that uh, look, the Broncos were really small up front. I was like, the Titans are going to try to bully them and run the football. They were like yeah, 25th in DVOA against the run. Uh, I was like, you know, they're not going to they're not going to try to come out and sling it all over the yard with a you know quarterback coming back off of injury. Um, but then that's exactly what they ended up having to do because the running game got stuffed uh, and, and they turned it and were able to throw the football with success. So um, very strange game. Um, very, very odd uh, result. But nonetheless, I do think some of the stuff that we saw from Tannehill in that passing game is really encouraging to me because. That's not that's the one spot that you were worried about, right? Like, you know, they yeah, can run the football. We knew we know they can run the football. They play they they can stop the run better than anybody. That that's been their calling card, really. If you wanna if you wanna look at you know the game break, break down by segments, their run defense is phenomenal. Uh they rush the passer well, they've been tough against opposing passing games, even if they do give up a bunch of yards, it usually does not result in points, and they also get a lot of sacks and turnovers and things like that. So they have been excellent in all those phases. They've even been really good on special teams. They've been terrible passing the football. And, <laughs> yes. and for them to suddenly show life in that quadrant, I guess, of 
of this uh, this team is critical. They because they, they've got to be able to throw the ball at least to a satisfactory level. Like they don't have to be yep. excellent at it. They just have to be passing. Like they just need a passing yeah. grade. You know, they, they can get their A's and all their other Unintended. classes. Just right. get get your C and get out of here with the passing game. So um, I thought it was really encouraging some of the stuff that we saw um, from Tannehill. And we can look at some clips uh, from the game that, that kind of highlight some of that. Um, and uh, it, it's it's not only for me, like with Tannehill, obviously he's, he's a very intelligent uh, quarterback, very experienced quarterback. Um, but he's also a, a guy that just plays with a lot of timing and accuracy. And, and if you watch, you know, the things that Malik Willis struggled with were timing and accuracy like that. Those are where he's deficient. Now he's better than, than Tannehill at other things. Um, but to really make this offense tick, it, it just feels like you've got to be playing in rhythm because you can't dilly dally behind this offensive line. You know, it, it is get the ball out as soon as you can before, uh, you know, the, the guys on the other side destroy your quarterback. All right, so yeah, this is the uh, the slant to Traylon Burks, and, and Burks like Burks's return, I, I felt like was helpful uh, to some degree. Like he had three catches, I think, for twenty four yards or something like that. So not a huge day by any means, but you can right. see some of the stuff that uh, you want to see out of Burks, um, and, and particularly in this in this snap here, because he is uh, working against Patrick Sertan, obviously the the Broncos soon to be uh pro bowl all pro whatever recognition you want to ha- have corner i mean he's he's best arguably corner the best in the league in the NFL right now yeah yep. um and uh you can see the benefit of burks here because he, that big body at 63 225 frame he's just able to kind of box him out he uses his body to shield uh sertan off the ball and and gives just Tannehill a big target he can just put the ball on the frame and, and let burks make the catch against tight coverage. So, I mean, this is something that the Titans really don't have because while Nick Westbrook Akine is, is a bigger receiver at, at, I think he's about six two two ten. 210. He's not quite the same yeah. size strength player uh, that Burks is certainly not, the not same at all. Strength nope. he, he's, uh, he's does not have the build that Burks does. So Burks brings nope. several different elements to, to, table that the Titans just have totally lacked and contested catch making is definitely one of those. Um, I believe this one here is the, uh, the big strike to Chig Chig. Um, yep. Which is, uh, on, it came on a third down. Um, the Titans go empty here, which I, I really like, uh, this look from them because they, they are getting their best five receivers in this game on the field. So the, the personnel out here is Chig Hooper, uh, Burks, Woods and NWI is the receiver. So, and they're all just, you know, kind of spread out and, and Tannehill's matchup hunting right here. Right. And so by alignment, he knows Chig is going to be covered by one of these linebackers. He, you know, the safety, it looks like Jackson is deep enough that he he's not going to have him underneath. So, um, you know, this is a example of one, a really nice route by Chig because you can see he is, kind of working off of 49 here, the inside linebacker, I think it's Singleton. Um, but he attacks right at his hip initially. He runs right at mm-hmm. his hip and is giving the impression that he's running more of a shallow cross. And then as, right as he gets into his blind spot, you can see he kind of goes vertical again and gets a little bit of depth to get behind him and give Tannehill that window to get the ball up and over the linebacker and down in front of the safety. So really nice route by Chig and then a really nice throw by Tannehill. I mean, this is an anticipation throw. Um, Chig has underneath, He's. I mean, he's kind of bracketed high and low here, um, but Tannehill knows he can fit this ball in and he does. He hits him in stride and he puts it in a spot where Chig can make the catch, bounce off of this tackle and then make a huge play, which which ends up really netting them three yard, or three points here because – they can uh, they get down into field goal range. They end up being able to kick the field goal to go up seventeen to ten uh, and put them right. in a more comfortable spot uh, towards the end of that game. But yeah, Chig obviously needs to be used more. Like there's zero doubt. Like it's every time they throw him the ball, something good is happening for the offense. Um, they've got to find a way to continue to get averaging the ball over twenty up. yards a game. Yeah, 
Yeah, it, it's uh, it's really been impressive watching him uh, and what he can bring to the table. So they've got to find a way to get him the ball more, but I really liked that throw um, and, and just that offensive look um, from the Titans, getting those guys out there, spreading it out, and letting Tannehill kind of hunt for what he likes. So um, that's something that's, that's relatively exciting to see from, from this offense and something that obviously they weren't as willing to do with Malik Willis under center just be simply because he's not uh he's not as adept at reading and understanding what NFL defenses are doing to him as what Tannehill is. And, and the touchdown right. throw to NWI I thought was the perfect example of that because that, that was you could see it pre-snap. You know, Tannehill is you know spread you know has the the offense spread out initially. And this is actually after he kind of pulls Hooper in. So initially Hooper is spread out into the slot um, pre-snap and then he, Tannehill stops. He sees the blitz coming. He sees that the, the Broncos are bringing um, what is effectively a, a zero blitz at him. Uh, both those linebackers are going to end up walking up and, and they had walked up before Tannehill backed him off and brought Hooper back in tight to the formation. So he knew he needed to get extra bodies in there, reset his protection, and then he would have one-on-one -on -one matchups and he could kind of hunt and pick uh, again to, to choose where he wants to go. Um, so he brings Hooper in. That way they can get a hat on a hat up front, give him enough time to get this ball away. And then the throw, obviously, to, to NWI on this this corner route is is perfect. Like, he couldn't have put it in a better spot. NWI does a nice job of getting the, the, the catch and the toes down and bounds, obviously. Um, but this is one of those things where – Tannehill's picking up what the defense is throwing at him pre-snap. He's adjusting his protection. He's making sure he's protected. He's got the time. And then he's able to, he knows, he knows that Kareem Jackson is going to end up being the cover man on NWI. Just, you know, if, if he knows the zero blitz is coming, he knows that 22 is on 15 and that's a matchup that they like because you've got a safety on a wide receiver. So that's why he's yep. going there and that's why he's attacking him. And it's just, it's high level football thinking from your quarterback that happens in real time. It's got to happen quickly. It's got to be, you know, and then you've got to have the, the throw and the accuracy and all that. So Tannehill does an excellent job with that stuff. It's something, you know, you wouldn't expect Malik Willis to be good at this. He's a rookie. Like nobody's saying that, sh that he should be good at this, yeah. but this is why, like when you see this big gap and we talk about, you know, Tannehill is like years ahead of Malik Willis right now as an NFL quarterback, this is what, this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. It's, it's not that, you know, the physical stuff is one thing, but all the mental stuff is just so much at the NFL level. There's so much put on these quarterbacks and uh, you know, it's not that Malik Willis can't do it. I, I think he is a, a smart guy. I think he's going to be able to pick things up as he goes, but he just does not have the experience with it right now. And it is hard to really understand it at a high level, unless you've been doing it for 10 years, like Ryan Tannehill has. So um, this is really exciting stuff to see. It's, you know, the, the protection's not even great here. Like there's still pressure in his face. He still delivers an accurate ball. Um, protection continues to be the one thing that I think is, is the Achilles heel of this offense, but seeing, Tannehill play at this level immediately upon returning with still, you know, what's probably an ankle that still just doesn't feel quite right. Um, you could see it when he had that scramble and he came up limping. I know uh, it doesn't. I asked him after the game. Yeah. So it's, it's encouraging to see him play like this uh, in this situation and to be able to use these weapons. I mean, like, I know the Titans don't have like a uber talented receiving core, but it is a lot better when you do have Traylon Burks out there. It is a lot better. Uh, you know, when you've got, you know, Austin Hooper and Chig starting to be able to make plays for you, you know, they had so many new guys and just the experience and Tannehill starting to get timing down with those guys will continue to pay dividends, I think. And, and when you add Kyle Phillips back to this mix, I still think you've got enough there that you can put together, again, a passable passing attack. Not, not great. It's not going to be the Chiefs. It's not going to be the Dolphins, it's not going to be, uh, you know, an elite passing game, but it's got to be just good enough to go with an elite defense and to go with an elite running game. And I think they can get there if they can block it, block it well enough. That is the big question that I still Big have. if, huge. But I, I, I think the weapons 
you're starting to see it kind of come around a little bit. You're starting to see the 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 connection and timing with Tannehill starting to get better, and that's critical for this team. And look, they're going to have to be a quick like rhythm and passing offense. Like that, that's going to be what this has to become. I think some of the play action shots, you know, are going to have to be they're going to be a little bit more selective with that stuff because they just can't block it. Yep. Um, and it's going to have to be, have to be like Tampa to Bay is right now. Get the ball out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you see these offensive lines that are struggling around the league and, and you've got to find ways to work around it um, because it is very difficult for these guys to hold up. I mean, pass, pass rusher, almost every team has a dude or two as a pass rusher. And you're going to see them like for the rest of the year, you know, somebody's going to have a bad matchup on this offensive line and they're just going to have to work around it. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they choose to do that. But this was a game where they showed that, hey, they have an opportunity to do that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is our last clip here. Um, yep. Yeah. And this is the, the drop to Robert Wood. So, again, I, I want to show this clip because. Tannehill was playing at a super high level in this game, in my opinion. He should have had a better day than he did. He gets pressure, and you'll see it's it's a miscommunication, it looks like, between Dennis Daly and Aaron Brewer uh, as far as passing off whatever blitz uh, the Broncos were bringing off that left side. You, you can see Daly initially engages uh, with this defensive end, but then he drops him thinking he needs to pick up uh, the blitzer even though Hilliard is really there to pick up the blitz. So I think that's really on daily. Um, but either way, there is a free rusher coming right in Tannehill's lap. He gets hit right as he throws it, and he puts this ball dead on the money to Robert Woods, hits him right in his chest, and he drops it. Now, Woods has to make this catch, but this throw by Tannehill is really, really high-level stuff because you'll watch when he releases this ball, Woods is not – out of his break yet he's really barely started his break so this is again this is a timing and trust throw um where Tannehill showing anticipation he's showing you know a lot of trust in Robert Woods that hey he's gonna break it off at the right spot he does he gets where he needs to be he just doesn't make the catch so yeah Woods has to finish that play but that is that's the kind of stuff from Tannehill that you really like to see and when he's playing at, at his best that's the kind of stuff that he can do, and he's got as much pocket toughness as any quarterback in the NFL, in my opinion. Like, the ability to I – mean, he knows he's about to get drilled right in the face here. I mean, and he's got a yep. gimpy ankle, all that stuff. But he stands in, throws it accurately, follows through, gets an accurate ball out there uh, to Woods, and, and then takes the shot. That is harder to do than, than you might think. Um, and Tannehill does it regularly. So I, I just wanted to, to point out some of those clips where I thought Tannehill was fantastic in this game. Um, and if he's going to play like that, this team has a real chance to, to start to figure things out offensively, I think, because it's, it's been bad. It's been bad almost all season on offense. I mean, they, they still haven't scored more than, what, 24 points, I think, in a single game. Um Yes, they have a chance to figure it out if Tannehill's going to play like this and if they can get the running game going. Like the running game was abysmal in this game, like absolutely awful. It Bad. was easily the yeah. worst game of the year. Um, under under three and, yards per carry from Henry, under sixty yards as a team, I believe. And Tannehill put this offense on on his back and brought them back from down ten. Uh, you know, right there at the end of the the first half, getting that two minute drive touchdown, and, and then you know they they moved the ball well in the second half. I mean. The, if you look at the way their drives ended, that, that Robert Woods drop right there uh, ended a drive, and then they had uh, the obviously the dumb Malik Willis fumble um, ended a drive, but they moved the ball really, really well consistently in the second half of that game and mostly through the air, almost exclusively through the air, honestly. So if they can, if they found something, if they started to get something to click confidence wise uh, with this, um, passing game. I, I think that is a huge deal for the prospects of this team moving forward. No, I agree entirely. This is kind of a side note, but I'm curious when, when, and if um, we get to see the full complement of Titans receivers come back. So Kyle Phillips comes back off the IR at this point, And also this is a, I guess a side note to the side note. I, I wouldn't be holding your breath for a racing big math appearance at all this year. At this point, it doesn't seem to me like that's, uh, the where this is headed is that kind of the inclination you've gotten as well? 
That's that. Yeah, that's the feeling that I get is that if he comes back, it's going to be very, very late in the year. And I, I just, at some point, they're going to go with the guys that are available, right? Like if McMath does come back, I don't think he's likely to make a huge impact as a receiver. You know, if anything, maybe he does, you know, slot into a special team role or something like that. But I, my guess is we probably won't see him this year um, because frankly, Which is a real like, shame. It is. It's too bad because he will, he did have a really good training camp. He he did look like a guy that was poised to maybe take a next step and and do some things for them on offense as well as what he can do on special teams. But um, frankly, like if they can get Phillips put back in the mix, they're going to have four wide receivers that they feel pretty <laughs> good about. I feel like uh, as far as putting out there and using in the passing game, plus the two pass catching tight ends, I think that's enough to be able to do some stuff with, with the passing game. And look, you know, Racy's probably the fastest receiver they've got. Um, but I think you can use Traylon Burks as a, as a field stretcher if they want to uh, start to, you know, unleash him on some of that stuff down the field, which I hope we do see sometime soon, because that, that's something that I really feel like he's good at. Um, and yep. I think that's going to be what they settle into. They're going to use, a combination of of Burks and Woods and NWI and Phillips, and they're going to mix and match and and use those guys in certain you know try to put them in the best positions to succeed that they can. But those guys are going to play the vast majority of the wide receiver snaps from here on out as long as they're healthy. You know that that's always the caveat, but that is your group. Like those are your pass catchers. Right. That's going to be what they roll with, and and I think that's good enough for them to do what they need to do in the passing game. So the question is this, if and when they get Kyle Phillips back healthy, we, you were talking about kind of their best five personnel when they go, when they go Hooper, Chig, Burks, <clears throat> and then at the, at that point, you, you kind of have to choose between NWI, R Robert Woods, who, do you, uh, excuse me, NWI, Robert Woods and Kyle Phillips. Yeah. Who do you, who do you think that they slot in there? Who's going to get, because somebody, somebody has to to sub out there. I mean, do, do you think yeah. that, I, sorry to, to wrap this question up with a bow, which is very disjointed at the <laughs> beginning of the year, it felt like the, the base personnel would be Burks woods Phillips. Yeah. But if NWI has another very good game or even another, you know, nice game, say he has five catches for 60 yards to, uh, on Thursday night. Like, do you think that, they may bump woods out of the rotation the way that they're kind of trending in opposite directions. It's possible. I, I definitely think they're, they have shown a willingness to go with a hot hand before at certain positions. Right. So and they've also I, I shown think, a willingness to love NWI more than anybody else is like as a team. That's true. I mean, in NWI, like I, he's not going to be a very good separator against man coverage. That's nope. just like not, part of what he is but the part of the reason that he had a really strong game against denver in my opinion is denver does play a lot of zone and he's uh, very zone good it's settling into the soft parts of the zone it's what he's he made he his knows red that with part yeah of the game really well he he's obviously a good blocker and like yes i know people get really tired of hearing the titans talk about receivers blocking but if you're going to be a team that runs derrick henry like 50 percent plus of the time uh then you need guys that can really block um and, and two or three of NWI's difference. big catches in this past game he was wide open by like 15 yards that's not yeah. him shaking a guy out of his boots that's him sitting down in a, in a portion of the zone that didn't have a defender exactly and and that's really like what he can do and I think it may be a situation where they will deploy these guys situationally because I do think if you're going against a man-to-man -man defense, you really want Burks, Woods, and Phillips out there. If you're playing mm -hmm. against his own defense, you know, maybe it makes more sense to to throw NWI in there in place of, you know, I, I think Woods is actually a pretty good zone uh, receiver, but maybe you you put him out there in place of one of the rookies that just don't have the same feel, don't have the, you know, the same, uh, you know, level of understanding with Tannehill at this point in their careers. But it's, I think it's going to be – they're going to be used situationally, and they're going to rotate. Like, you can get – you've got enough snaps to go around to where you can keep guys pretty fresh and uh, and use their skill sets for, for what they are. Like, you don't have to have Burks play 100% of snaps for him to be effective. Like, he can take some snaps off and let NWI block uh, on some first down, you know, runs and stuff like that, and then come in and, and have the, the high leverage passing situations where you've got a better target. So – 
I think it'll be those four in a mix and it may be some hot hand and it may be just some situational, like who do you want in this matchup versus this specific slot corner or this specific, you know, uh, outside corner or whatever, you know, they may be able to match up hunt and mix and match more, which I mean, they've got a really like interesting and diverse group of skill sets uh, among those four. Um, mm -hmm. you know, no, no two are really similar uh, at that point. So it's, it's kind of an interesting mix and it'll be interesting to see how they're deployed and, Honestly, I, I wish they'd use Chig like almost as a wide receiver too. I mean, he's yeah, yeah, he's a tight end, but he runs like a wide receiver, and and you can put him in in positions where he can have a mismatch just because of his physicality. Um, I think yeah, he's you know, not. I mean, he's not the greatest route runner. You you can no. see in in the film that it. I mean, in that in his big play in particular, like it was a nice route in terms of finding the soft spot of the zone. Like he ran to the correct place yeah. in terms of sharpness. It it was uh, a little little rounded off. It wasn't the oh, footwork yeah. wasn't wasn't it, you know it's a tight end running a route right. right. Um, but he's he's the kind of guy where if they can work against you know zone defenses or scheme him up where they get him one on one against a you know a, fa a flat footed linebacker or somebody that he could best in that way, you just have to you have to scheme him up to get him in space. He he's not going to be able to make that space for himself necessarily if that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a little hard on the Titans, especially on first and second down to put Hooper and Chig out there together just because they're not like, and we've talked about this before, like the Titans really have two different tight end positions. And one is a Y yep. type stapled to the tackle. Primary purpose is blocking. That's that's a role that they have to have on this team, and Swaim is still the best at it, even though he's not great. And I know he can't catch, and you know all this other stuff. It's I get or run I routes get or adjusting the ball, or <laughs> yeah, I, I totally get the first athletic. But you know. for that, like for the first and second down stuff, it's it's going to be hard for them to get away from Swaim just because he is a better blocker than Hooper or Chig. As far as like the way his assignment is, which his assignment is double teaming with the tackle or blocking an end one-on-one -on -one. like you don't want chig who's 240 pounds blocking you know a 270 pound def defensive end he's just not big enough to do it like swaim yeah. is um and that's why they use him so much and why he plays so much but right they do have to find a way and whether it just is a third down package or if it, you know, they, they maybe mix in some of this stuff on early downs too. They do have to find a way to get Hooper and Chig out there more together. I feel like, because that is a matchup problem for teams because, you know, Hooper isn't a great separator, but like NWI, he is a good, he's, he's got a good feel for his own um, mm -hmm. and he can settle down and, and make a catch. And he's been really good on, on contested catches, obviously, this year. He's so got he, good hands, and he's got good ability to adjust his body quickly. I mean, that's the biggest yeah. thing with with Swaim that differentiates him and Hooper to me is that Swaim has poor hands. And when you, when you watch him, if the ball is not perfectly on, I forget this specific play, but there was a play near midfield in this past game. It was a pass to Swaim, and it was just off the mark um, it, because – Tannehill was being bore down on by by Rush and had to get it out, get it out early, and and so you know the ball was in play. I believe it hit Swaim in the hands, but you just watch and from the press box press box had the perfect angle on watching him try to adjust his body, and it it, it genuinely it looks like a trick play where you send the small guard out on a route it, trying to get an easy like a fat man touchdown. That's what it looks like him trying to adjust the ball. It's bad. It's very rough. And and he was wide open on that. Play. Wide open. Wide. He had thirty yards to run before he got touched. Yeah, he he would have been probably in the field goal range. Um, and yeah, it'd have probably been a thirty or forty yard gain. So it, it was that was a tough one to watch. Um, <laughs> yeah, with, with Swain there and like like I get it. You don't want him really being thrown the football. Um, if you can avoid it, but he is going to have a role. Like I know, like everybody gets so mad when they see him on the field, but he is just going to be out there. It just be okay with it at this point. Cause he's going to have a role. Who's the, who's the other tight end on this roster that you pointed out early on when they brought him in that does the Kevin same Raider. thing. Kevin yeah. Raider. Raider. Do you think that Titans fans would be more at ease if the Titans just ran with Raider in the same way they're rolling out Swaim right now, but the fact that it's not Swaim anymore, people would be at ease about it. 
I kind of feel like it because I, I do think part of it is just uh, you know people. Swaim has that that target on his back now, right? Yes. I mean, it's like the he's tainted uh, goods. He's no like there's no there's no thing he can do for the Tennessee Titans right now besides becoming a miraculous catcher of the football that would make him. I mean, he could have a he could have a 100 PFF blocking grade in three games in a row, and nobody would care. Nobody. Yeah, everybody still would hate still him. be like, get him off the field. I get don't him care. off the field. He can't catch. Yeah, I mean, Sw- <laughs> Swaim is – he's in the Hollister zone, right? Like, <laughs> he time someone sees him on the field, they just get angry and start yelling on Twitter about why is he on the – why is he in the game? Um, you know, cut him right now. It's mm-hmm. – but, look, yeah, Swaim, Raider – these guys are necessary evils. Like they, you do have to block at some point. You have to have guys that can block. So. Well, and there's some fault that lies on the shoulders of the Titans coaching staff as well, because if they didn't choose to try to throw the ball to Jeff Swaim nearly as much as they did, I mean, just a moment ago, you said you don't want him, you know, going out to have to run routes and catch the ball. If you don't have to, yeah. my initial mental reaction was, well, they don't have to, and they still do for fun yeah. for some reason. They know it makes people mad and they do it because it's funny to them. I guess that's only, that's the only thing I can I can <laughs> rationalize. Um, but I mean, in reality, I think what they think is they have to maintain some semblance of the element of surprise, keep the defense honest, and because that's the trap they got themselves in last year with the tight end position, right? I mean, they they really you talk about this year them having two different tight end positions. Last year they really had two different tight end positions, and the defense knew exactly what was going on, depending on the personnel in right now or in, in on that play. And and so I think that they're trying to maintain some semblance of, Oh, Austin Hooper, Jeff Swaim, they can do it all. Both of them can catch your block. You don't know what we're going to have them do. Um, and so it makes, it makes those guys take the heat when they're forced to do the thing that they're not good at. Right. Yeah. I, I would, I would agree with that. I do think, um, you know, some of the stuff with Swaim, like, you know, the tight end screen stuff and, and things like that. Like part of it is that, they are using the fact that he's not a very good pass catcher for the play design, right? Like it, sure. it is part of it that like, Hey, the defense isn't really going to be looking for him to release and, and catch a screen here. So why don't we use him in that role? We think he can catch a three yard screen pass. Um, and if he's wide open, you know, he, he can turn around and run with it as well as anybody, uh, you know, and some of that makes sense, but yeah, don't do it as little as possible. That, that, that yeah, Mike, every, really every sporting team in existence from Y league rec baseball and basketball to professional football has had that same idea where it's like, Oh, these are ace in the hole. They'll never see him coming. It only works if they're capable of doing the very mundane rudimentary task asked of them when they're not capable of doing it. Like, like you could have a hundred yards of free space to run, but if you can't catch the ball, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed yeah. to do? Exactly. Exactly. It's frustrating, but it is what it is. Anyways, um, we, we don't have any more film for you guys, but uh, we did watch the game and Mike, you got a chance to look at some of the film. And I wanted to ask um, because this was something that was floating around Twitter this week about, I feel like we haven't talked a whole lot about this offensive line the past couple of weeks in detail. Uh, we've talked about how the fact that they just continue to not be good and it continues to be an Achilles heel of this team. But we've gotten away from our weekly um, low light reel of Dennis Daly and talking about how NPF needs to improve. Um, and so I kind of want to circle back on that a little bit. And I'm sure we'll do that in detail next week on Thursday at a regular time from the Packers film. But from this Broncos game, was there anything that stood out to you or maybe the past couple of games that stood out to you about this offensive line? Um, on one hand, you, you had the pass protection ratings chart that was floating around on Twitter this week, it was a kind of a, a combination of the PFF and ESPN um, blocking scores that they, that they give or grades rather. So they took both of those and kind of made an average for each team and put them uh, first to last. The Titans ranked dead last in the league um, in that aggregate. They have a seven score on this rating for reference. The next closest team are the Colts who have a 26 score. Um, and so it, it, if the PFF score for the Titans, by the way, is zero, which is hilarious to me. Um, it, some people were asking me on Twitter how that's even possible. I don't know whether or not it's like a worst team gets a zero, best team gets a hundred thing. You got to hope that's the case. Otherwise that's a really brutal indictment, but also 
we just saw the Titans play in a game in which they had their best passing performance of the year, in your opinion and in my, my opinion. We saw the individual grades come out for these guys. and It was kind of surprising this week. You saw Dennis Daly, sneaky good game, according to the grade from PFF. What were your thoughts on the film and, and kind of what you saw throughout the game from the offensive line? Where is the weak link still daily? Um, is, is there anybody taking a step forward or backwards? What are your thoughts? You know, so I, I think the last couple of weeks, you know, Nate Davis has not been quite as good as what he was before the injury. I don't know if he's still kind of playing his way back through whatever that foot issue was that he had, um, you know, that, that knocked him out for a couple of games. Um, so I, I think Davis has been not quite as good. Now he also, uh, you know, faced uh, Chris Jones and then uh, – uh, Draymond Jones, who, you know, Draymond Jones isn't as famous of a name, but Draymond Jones is an excellent, excellent interior pass rusher for the Broncos. So he, he's had a couple of tough matchups, but he hasn't played quite as well as he was earlier in the year. And then, you know, I, I still think Daly's the, the weakest link to me. The biggest thing that changed in this uh, game against the Broncos is, is just that Tannehill was getting the ball out quickly. Like his average time to throw in this game was 2.41 seconds. So uh, he was Very catching low. the ball and getting it out. I mean, among all uh, qualifying quarterbacks last week, he had like the, I think, fifth uh, quickest time uh, to release. So, and that's not really normal for the Titans. Like they're usually closer to middle of the pack or lower because they, they run so much play action. Um, so they went with a little bit more of a quick passing game, which I think they need to lean into because they, they are not going to get a lot better at pass blocking. I just don't think they are because I think Daly is a very, very limited player physically. Um, I think Brewer's pretty limited physically as a pass blocker. Uh, and, and, you know, Nate Davis is a, it was much improved before the injury, but you know, whether he's going to get back to that level or not, or if this is an injury that's going to kind of linger with him for the rest of the year, I don't know. Um, but you hopefully you hope that he gets better. And then, you know, Nicholas Petit Frere still has some rookie moments too. Like he's been better uh, right. after the bye week but he's still not like super high end as far as just shutting down a pass rush. So they have a lot of problems. Uh, up front as far as a pass blocking group and, and the best way to counteract that is just get the ball out as quick as you can and, and don't let those issues become you know something that destroys the game so um yeah i i, I just i don't know that it's going to get better i mean maybe it gets a little bit better you hope that it gets a little bit better but it, it's not going to be they're not going to go from worst to first right like it, they're, sure. they're going to be at best uh, a lower half probably pass blocking unit for the rest of this year. Um, just when you don't have really good tackles, that, that is what, that is reality, you know, in, in yes. the NFL. So, yep. You are handicapped. Well, that is our review of the Titans Broncos game. Thanks for everybody stopping by and listening in. If you're listening for free, unfortunately, this is the end of the road for you. Again, we promise to do a much more complete what you're used to film review next week when we don't have a short week and we're not uh, forced to try to get things out a little earlier reviewing the Titans Packers game, which of course is on Thursday night football. We'll be talking about that game, previewing it behind the paywall here in just a moment. So if you want to hear that as well as our moneymaker Mike segment, which is up still 19 and 16 on the year, making you money back. If you just become a Broadway insider, pay the couple of bucks to join and get the rest of the show. And then just bet with us on the show. You're going to make your money back. It's a free content hack guys. I, I don't know if you're not taking it. You, you must just, you must just hate the Titans or us um, or happiness. I don't know. Um, but those are the things we're going to talk about behind the paywall. A lot of talkers, talkers, Titans and Packers talk to be had um, before this game later Thursday night, as well as our Mike drop segment, which always is entertaining. Mike has got his hottest take of the week ready for us. Uh, and that's always a fun way to get out of here in order to get all of that good stuff, as well as all of our premium articles written by, folks like me and Zach Lyons and Justin Mello and others on broadwaysportsmedia.com, as well as early access articles. We're going to have a lot of World Cup coverage coming up. By the way, kind of snuck up on me. I was like to a friend the other day, like when did World Cup start next week or two? And he's like, yeah, three days. Oh, cool. Got it. Um, that's kind of sneaking up us, sneaking up on us here. And I mean, Mike, you can attest to the fact that the, the Speedway soccer guys at Broadway Sports Media are the best doing it in Nashville in Tennessee, there's nobody doing better uh, soccer coverage, whether it's Nashville SC 
or on the uh, continental stage or on the world stage than the guys here at Broadway Sports Media, the Speedway Soccer crew with Chris Ivey and Ben Wright and all of those guys do such a phenomenal job. If you're going to follow the, the Team USA throughout the World Cup, which is going to be exciting this year for the first time in a while, uh, first time they're in the World Cup in a while, you got to follow those guys. They do such, such a good job, don't they, Mike? Yeah, they're awesome. They they, they are uh, they are the best soccer uh, writers, content providers. Period in this market, um, without a doubt. Like you know, and and uh, you know, those guys are going to do it. Great job for the World Cup. I'm excited about the World Cup. Always love watching it. And I'm glad you know U.S. is back in it uh, this year. And and like a pretty young, exciting team to watch. So a couple know, we'll of National SC uh, guys on the roster. I mean, yeah, there's some local yeah. appeal as well. Absolutely. Yeah, this this it should be a good one. It should be a lot of fun to uh to follow and obviously it gets uh started with a bang here with uh US England. Uh I know. Huge. Is that is that on Thanksgiving? I believe it is. Yeah. What an unbelievable day of sports it's going to be. That is um, I don't I I've not thought I mean, just now returning from the honeymoon, I've not thought out fully what my next couple of weeks look like in terms of content and just trying to get up to speed, but I can go ahead and tell y'all if you're listening at home, expect nothing from me on Thanksgiving. I'm going to be in a food coma watching football and Team USA all day. Mike, it's, you should as it's well. Black Frank, Friday. It's Black Friday. I just it's Black Friday. Okay, well, those two days then. That's Thursday, actually, Friday, I'm out. Don't don't expect anything from me. Uh, you all shouldn't be listening to podcasts really anyways. Frankly, you should be watching the incredible sports that we have that day. And as director of published content at BroadwaySportsMedia.com, I can tell you that behind the wall of our site where all the all the uh, the co- the cookies are made, I can see what content is being cooked up. And the Speedway Soccer guys have a ton of World Cup content that they are, for the past month, have been cooking up behind the scenes in preparation for this, this month uh, or so of World Cup coverage. And not all of it is going to be free. So a lot of that stuff is going to be coming to you as a benefit if you're a Broadway insider, which you can become for just 99 cents for your first month if you use code INSIDER or get 20 bucks off the annual price using code ANNUAL. For just $49.99, you can have all of this content for a year. Go to broadwaysportsmedia.com, subscribe, and then come right back on over in the website. Just search the Mike Herndon Show, find today's episode. And once you're an insider, you can find the full version YouTube behind the paywall right there in the browser or in YouTube for you to enjoy. All right, that's enough of my rambling. To all of our free listeners, we will talk to you again next week, but you should become premium members and listen to the rest of the show.